There we go. Uh, hopefully you're seeing both of us now. Hi there. <laughs> it's great to have you on, Ramon. Yeah, Yay. thank you for having me on. I am so happy to be talking to you in, well, in person-ish, pandemic person. In person-ish. That's probably the best uh, best term to describe <laughs> conditions, right? It's uh, It's been a strange time, I'm sure, for you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, although I must say it is nice to not continually be on the road. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, usually I'm away from home like 60 to 70 percent of the time. So, you know, it's nice to be not jet lagged and in one location. <laughs> I do miss the travel myself. So I have a, a, a also bit. a pretty aggressive travel schedule for my work. Yes, and, you are. And, uh, it's it's a little bit of a bummer not to have, you know, kind of a new country to check out <laughs> every couple of weeks. That is very true. That is very true. And by the way, I will add that we'll probably get some sort of accompaniment from my cat and or my dog. My that's... The dog is sitting right, right down here, and the cat's kind of behind the computer right now. So I love that. So my cat <laughs> is in hiding somewhere, and she's done really well so far at not making an appearance in this show. But I feel like one of these days she's going to demand her cameo. Oh, so <laughs> And uh, my, my pets are attention hogs, so the cat makes it a point <laughs> to be vocal. I, I've just joined this um, this like Oxford commission. We're actually going to be announcing it pretty soon. And we've decided that she is our unofficial mascot because she's very vocal during all of our commission calls. So. It's perfect. So what's what's really cool about getting a chance for us to finally sit down and talk is that, you know, as you mentioned, you're traveling a lot and I'm traveling a lot. And I know that we have been following each other on Twitter for a while. And it seems like yes. our, our paths keep crossing. We'll be like in the same city, uh, either like on the same airport. day or... Like, yeah, ship's passing in the night, and we just yeah, haven't had yeah, a chance yeah. to uh, overlap enough to sit down. So this is it. This is our first chance to do that, and that's really exciting. Um, to me, it's exciting because uh, from the moment I, I first kind of I interacted with your profile and, and with you online, I, I got the sense that, first of all, I, I love how you put, come across online, but that you're area of focus is so um it's so relatable to me you know this this intersection of course of ai and humanity is very parallel yeah. to mine and tech and humanity but also yeah. i noticed um that you have degrees in political science and so mm -hmm. i thought it's your your phds in political science even mm -hmm. isn't it yep. Yep. yeah so I, to me that is in incredibly intriguing because it, it sort of I can relate to the idea, not that, you know, I have a background in political science, mine is in languages, but just this idea mm -hmm. that, that that education and that framework probably shapes, you know, your thinking and your mindset about things, right? And yeah, the, the, the idea of systems and, and the public good and, and that sort of thing. How does that, how does that shape your work and your thinking? Yeah, um, so the thing that really drew me to political science, and this was actually even as an undergrad at MIT, was the idea of essentially like distilled to its basic, it's like quantitative social science is math with context. And I really like math with context. Right. <laughs> uh, and, or maybe another way to put it would be, uh, I think it's really fascinating to understand at a high level uh, patterns of human behavior using data. But the way I framed all of those sentences, uh, well, especially the second one, you know, centralizes the human, it centralizes society. And what I find intriguing slash frustrating, depending on, you know, my mood at the moment, is that often when we talk about technology like artificial intelligence, but technologies in general, but especially with AI, we've started to kind of talk about the, like the technology as if it supersedes the human. And I have this whole article I, I wrote called The Retrofit Human, where I, I raised that concern, like, why is it we build technology and assume the human being fits in afterwards, and we really should be doing it the other way? We yes. need to be designing our tools, because these things are tools, we need to be designing our tools to help us. We shouldn't be re, like, you know, recreating how we naturally are or want to be to fit someone's notion of how society ought to be. So in your mind, what is that kind of core human concept? Because to me, I, I, I also mentioned, um, you know, that, that a lot of the ideas felt parallel in our work. And one mm -hmm. of the things that, mm -hmm. that I find I keep coming back to in my work <clears throat> at the core of human experience feels like meaning and the make, making meaning yeah. and the quest for meaning. And so that's one theme that just over and over again, I keep finding myself returning to. Is there a similar concept for you that you find yourself returning to in your work? Yeah, and I think... Like it's very parallel, unsurprisingly. I, I would say it's either something like human self-determination or human agency, but ultimately it's just 
the right to make an informed decision, the ability to, uh, you know, have all the information for yourself and make that choice. And, and, and I very carefully say that because I recognize and want a world in which people make decisions that I disagree with. But, you know, but they are making those decisions fully informed, fully capable. So to your point on, on meaning, whether it's, you know, being able to derive good meaning from the systems we've created to make good decisions or understanding what our meaning is or what our purpose is as, uh, as a human being and not having that be shaped or guided by other forces unknowingly. That's my dog. And yeah. Then, <laughs> is the dog going to make a cameo? Is that? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure he wants to. Come here. Come here. Do you want to say hi to everybody? No, he does not. Pet Canaanis show. <laughs> That's fantastic. He just kind of at the door and he is a pet, so I apologize for the pawing at the door. Oh no, the the pawing at the door just makes me feel sad. <laughs> we gotta get a little it's, cameo action. Well, the thing is, if I like open the door, he'll go out and then he'll pawing come back in. So it's the whole. It's a whole thing. Well, no, and I love how you put it, and I think I think uh, you know the agency and the self determination is a, is a really solid piece of of what always kind of comes back to me too. I've lately started thinking about you know how we talk in in literature and culture about the human condition. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, and I feel like that when you break down what the elements you know what we're typically talking about when we talk about the human condition, it does seem like you know, agency and, you know, sort of control over your own destiny at some level is is part of that, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and I think what's really great about it is, you know, it's it's not normative or judgmental. Like I said, I'm not trying to enforce my values on someone else. My point is that we should all make informed decisions yeah, um, and, yeah. be, and have transparency into the systems that are maybe shaping us or guiding us or giving us opening doors or closing others. So when it comes to AI, then it seems like th where that carries over is into the idea of, you know, transparency or explainability. And is that what generally, when you talk about responsible AI as the scope of the work that you do, is it generally focused on those attributes or are there other attributes that are even maybe more pertinent to that consideration? Yeah, I mean, so... Certainly responsible AI covers those fields. I think those fields are incredibly important. I think that, you know, of course, any conversation about responsible AI would be remiss not to talk about uh, fairness and accountability, um, particularly when we think about biases and biases in the technology that's being built. And I, I know this has been kind of a contentious topic lately, especially on Twitter, but what isn't a contentious topic on Twitter, right? Um, <laughs> biologists talking about worms has become a massive topic <laughs> right. of contention, if you've seen. Don't bring up uh, cake. That's all. <laughs> we just don't oh, need to gosh. talk about like, cake right now. <laughs> it's a lot. I mean, look, like, reality's already turned upside on its head. I want to be able to trust that, that, that the shoe is a shoe and not really the cake. Um, but, you know, what, what I'm sad to see often is that so much of the work on responsible AI you know, gets divided into camps of like this, you know, politically correct culture and non political or like whatever, whatever the opposite of politically right, correct right. is, right? Um, but that's not not what it is. It's it's not like normative judgment passing, uh, at least not for me. Um, you know, if, for me, it is you know just making sure that we are aware and have some control or agency and some right to uh, understand and have impact on the systems that are you know shaping. Uh, like the, the actions we're able to take in our lives. Yeah, and I think you, you bring up a really good point because it does seem like that issue of um, uh, sort of the, the critique of responsible AI or the, the mechanisms of responsible AI um, that talks about political correctness and, you know, we're, we're having such a moment where people are, uh, you know, hitting at this bogeyman yeah. of cancel culture and, and political correctness. Yeah. So, so with this uh, tweet from Paul Graham uh, in the last couple of days that he says, you know, yeah. people get mad when AIs do or say politically incorrect things. What if it's hard to prevent them from drawing such conclusions? And the easiest way to fix this is to teach them to hide what they think. That seems a scary skill to tar start teaching AIs. I imagine you have a response for that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just like, before I even get into what I think, like, sort of let's unpack all of the assumptions behind that statement. There's just a lot of anthropomorphizing happening. Like, what is this, like, teaching the AI to hide? Like, these are not, like, these are technical systems, right? They are making, yes, it is a predictive model. It is, quote, making decisions, but not in the sense that human beings make decisions. Like, teaching, you, you don't really teach 
an algorithm to quote lie. Mm-hmm. You, you can do particular things to it to make it come up with certain answers or not come up with certain answers. But if you are hiding output or hiding outcomes, that's a human decision from a design perspective. So like, let's talk about the people who are creating. Ultimately, that's the weird thing about that statement. This is weird anthropomorphizing happening. I just, I simply cannot understand. Like, you know, it, it, and this is not like sort of the responsible AI community saying this. We have plenty of people, you know, who are some of the, the trailblazers in the field of artificial intelligence saying like, we are nowhere near the singularity. We are not near any right. sort of AI system. And, you know, we will define it as like narrow AI. We are in the world of narrow AI. So let's, Let's 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 box this into what it is today. Like we are nowhere near creating this system that's quote lying or quote making decisions. We're in a world of narrow AI. We apply things to very narrow use cases. So that's that's one. Like it's hiding things is very odd to me. Um, and like it's not about having politically correct answers. To be like I I work for Accenture. Uh-huh. Um, Accenture is you know obviously they were forward thinking and hiring somebody to do responsible AI. I don't sit in corporate social responsibility. I don't sit in corporate citizenship. Those are amazing parts of Accenture and parts of every company. But I sit in core business functions. If Accenture, a half million person company, thought that responsible AI was creating politically correct answers, I don't know if I, you know, I mean, I'm not our CEO, but like, that'd be a strange place to put somebody. Yeah, that's a I'm really interesting of- point. Right? Like I'm part of core business functions. My job is to create solutions with value. If you're creating a product that doesn't serve a portion of your population, you have not created a good product. So for example, if you are making a credit lending model that is discriminatory towards women because of the history of credit discrimination against women, this is not about put not about politically correct culture. Do you just want to not give people money who would pay you back? Like I don't understand. Like do you do you not want to make revenue off your product because you are you have literally an underserved market. So you are telling me that you don't want to address an underserved market. Like, and, and, and in some sense, like in a business sense, that is what some of this work is about. It is about making good products that serve your that serve your clients, that serve your customers. Yeah, um, yeah, one hundred percent. And I just want to interject there. I feel like I've seen interviews with you where you talk about the need for there to be discussion that's bigger than profitability and efficiency absolutely. when it comes to you know business uses of technology. Yeah, we need to understand you know what is. Um, you know, what's about humanity and her human flourishing. So it's really important that those yeah. attributes be part of that discussion too. But you're Absolutely. right at, at this core level, of course, business is going to be investing, you know, primarily into technology that's going capacity and scale to their opportunities. You know, I think, right. I think that's a, a savvy <laughs> observation and you're yeah. right. Like why would there be a function for responsible AI in the core business if it weren't, uh, likely to produce, you know, desirable outcomes for the business. Right, it, exactly. And also, I'd say, like, human flourishing, cre- you know, creating something with positive impact is not at odds with good business. And and frankly, you know, some this is what some of the biggest CEO, the CEOs of some of the biggest companies in the world recognize, that, you know, some of what you build, especially if you're a B2C company, is about brand. It's about how people feel when they interact with your technology or your product or, or, you know, if you're making like soda or a fast food chain uh, or clothing, like you are trying to spark an emotion. Uh, Frankly, right, people buy, like, especially in the US, we have no lack of choices. A lot of our goods are actually perfectly uh, substitutable. Why why do you buy Coke versus Pepsi? Why do you go to McDonald's versus Burger King? I'm just like naming things, right? right? Like some of this is an emotional decision. Um, and so it's, again, not necessarily some sort of weird, like, lefty PC culture to say, you know, we want to make things that make people feel good, that are aligned with, like, society's values. Um, and, you know, we're getting some pretty clear indicators of what a lot, a, a lot of people feel today. Uh, you know, branding is, is definitely important for companies. Yeah, yeah, and that's a really good point, too. I think that that comes up a lot in my own work, that, that the... <laughs> Uh, you know, I talk about meaningful experiences and people are always like, well, how do you measure meaningful experiences? It's like, well, you know, actually, if you're creating meaningful experiences, then you should have a whole host of holistic measures that tell you that you're on the right path. And everything you just talked about 
is all, yeah. you know, part of a model that actually tells you, you know, yeah. you're moving in the right direction. People can remember your brand. People have delightful experiences. They'll recommend you. They'll, they'll yeah. you know, your cost of acquisition and, and retention is going to be lower because people have good experiences with your brand. Right. So all of those things right. are and part of it. And it's also this notion of, of value, right? I, I think sometimes people can get overly narrow, narrowly focused on value as revenue generation. Value comes from many, many different things. And to be perfectly frank, you know, people often choose less, quote, efficient outcomes or, you know, less economically sound outcomes because of how it makes them feel. Right. Uh, you know, and, and I suppose maybe a frivolous example, but an extreme example of it would be why people buy luxury brands. You know, like, why would I buy a canvas bag from, like, Louis Vuitton versus Target? Canvas is basically canvas, right? right? Like, <laughs> Louis Vuitton doesn't make better canvas, but, like, they recognize that how it makes you feel and the experience. Or to give a techie example, mm -hmm. Apple spends so much money on design. They spend, like, like there are entire articles on how every Apple product, opening it is designed to feel like you're opening a present, like you're getting something special. Right. That was purely intentional. And if we're going to try to make this case that tech is about efficiency and value, then, you know, go talk to Apple because they don't seem to believe that, <laughs> right? They, they fully understand the experience of an individual in interacting with technology like a phone or a computer is also an emotional experience. Yeah, yeah. So, so in, in terms of, of AI and, and what the experiences we're going to be, we are increasingly creating with algorithms, algorithmically optimized systems, mm -hmm. You know, how can people think about more meaningful and more human flourishing kind of systems when it comes to those types of interactions? What What do you recommend there for people? Yeah, and, and here's where I think it's really interesting, like as a political scientist and a social scientist, because I, I draw a lot from my background when I think about these things. You mentioned the concept of systems earlier, mm -hmm. and this is absolutely true. Like these technologies don't live in a bubble. They exist as part of an existing infrastructure of systems that impact us. So if we're talking about, for example, a recommendation system to decide if, um, you know, uh, to help judges decide if, if certain prisoners should, you know, get bail or not get right. bail. Um, what's really interesting is not just how this impacts the prisoner, but also the role of the judge in sort of the structure of the judicial system and whether or not they feel they can, they need to be subject to the output of this model or whether they have the agency to say, I disagree with this and I don't. And that impacts you know, how this outcome plays out for the individual who's on trial, right? So a judge is somebody who is in a, a position of high social standing, you know, they're considered to be highly educated. If there's an algorithm and it's telling them something that they think is wrong, they may be in a better position to say, I disagree, I'm not going to do this, versus somebody who is, let's say, um, you know, an employee, like a, a warehouse employee at, at, like, at Amazon mm -hmm. or you know, somebody who works in retail at a store where your job is not necessarily considered to be high prestige and you may feel like your job is replaceable or worse, you may get in trouble if you're not agreeing with the output of this model. So like thinking about the system that surrounds these models, it could actually be kind of an identical structured model, but because of the individual's place in society, they can or cannot take action on it. So I think these things are, are really important, really important to think of. Yeah, that's a really important point. I find uh, in talking with companies too about um, employee experience and about thinking about how culture is going to be developed around digital transformation and how they're going to in incorporate more and more automation into their businesses. So much I find of that discussion needs to be about you know the, the increasing importance of good judgment from humans <laughs> you know like people being yeah, able to yeah. make good judgment calls and being able to say like this is asking me to do the wrong thing and the yeah. machine doesn't necessarily know that as you already said like there's not kind of hidden motives within the machine there there are hidden motives within code because coders put them there mm -hmm. but you know that it's not like um like humans shouldn't be able to question the output of these things so right. that's a, a brilliant yeah. point yeah, and, and like two, two points to that. One is when I talk to companies about governance, um, and, and AI governance has actually become like one of the bigger things to think about rather than just purely focusing on like model or model, model, model explainability. So like a few thoughts on governance. So again, kind of drawing from my background as a political scientist, I find it very interesting that 
all of us, even those in the responsible AI community, are approaching this notion of governance from a non-democratic perspective. Like what, what every organization is doing uh, when we create systems of governance is put get the smartest people together and figure out what governance means for everybody. Huh. And it's quite interesting because we all claim to adhere to very democratic principles, but very few organizations have actually created a truly democratic process for governance. So that's one. Right. Uh, the second very few I organizations say, have created really flat organizations too, and even though they right. claim that to have done so. So yeah, that's right, a very right, good point. Right. Yeah. Um, and then the second is like, so I, I we created um, like this, this handbook for companies called the Governance Guidebook, and it's a publicly available document. I can share it with you if you have like show notes and yeah, links, can yeah. actually put, put it in there. That'd be great. Uh, one thing, one thing that we call for is the notion of constructive dissent. So how do you actually enable safe channels of dissent within your organization? How can people feel comfortable saying, you know, this is not working or this is being done unethically or I disagree with what's happening here? And not just in a way that they're protected, but also in a way that they feel like their voices are being heard. Hmm. I think what, one of the issues with, you know, with uh, people being at odds with the organizations that they're with is not just that they disagree with what they're doing, but they everybody has the same story. When I tried to go to management, I was shut down. Nobody listened to me. It wasn't meaningfully addressed. And I think that that's a, that's a component of this um, that's really important, which kind of also ties into the third point that we haven't really solved this human in the loop problem. Everyone loves to use that phrase, but I, you know, it's really hard to think of different diff, uh, a good situation in in which we really resolved meaningful interaction between you know, a, a, an advanced predictive technology and a human being. Say more about that, because I'm not sure that many of our listeners will be uh, as familiar with, yeah. with that concept. Yeah, so folks always talk about human in the loop within an AI system. So, you know, the, the narrative would be, okay, well, we're worried about runaway AI or AI that makes biased decisions. And then the answer seems to be, well, put a human at the end of it, and then the human will kind of judge the output. And then the human has, has agency, they can say yes or no, and then that's that, right? But there are so many problems with this when you unpack that, that story. Like, it seems to work on face. But then we've already talked about a few issues. So number one, like, who is this person in this sort of structure of, you know, the hierarchy of humanity within the organization, within society? And can they actually agree or disagree with the output of the model? Are they in a position where they would be punished if they did? Are they incentivized to do so and not do so, et cetera? And then the second question is, this person on the end, can they even understand whether or not that decision was a good one or a bad one? Because that person may not, and actually often is not a technical person, they're not a data scientist, so how are they to understand whether or not this output makes sense or not? Um, and, and just a really good example, um, and a few months ago, there was a whole sort of Apple card debacle um, when Apple launched the credit card mm -hmm. and we had this the husband and wife and the husband got approved and the wife did not, even though I think she had a higher credit score and made more money. But here's the part that I think to me was the most meaningful around what we're talking about. So they call, you know, Apple or whoever, and they ask, you know, and, and again, it's back to this notion of constructive dissent and human in the loop. They ask, so like, hey, you know, my wife didn't get approved for the card and like, we're kind of wondering why, because, you know, like, that's weird. And the answer was, well, the algorithm said so, and so that's that's that. Right. And genuinely, like, that is not a good answer right. to give. And, but to the person on the end who's a customer service rep, right, the question here then becomes, how do we enable a customer service representative to understand whether or not this model output was problematic? Yeah. Like, like these are the people who should understand. It's not me as a data scientist or, you know, you as a technologist. It's actually the people who will be on the receiving end who will be and who will end up actually being the front line with the human beings who are being impacted. So like that's that's the human in the loop that I think needs to be resolved. Yeah, and I think in a in in a number of models, business models, you know, the the um the proposed answer tends to be we'll use a rating system to <laughs> evaluate how reliable this person's judgment or outcome or whatever is. Yeah. And of course then you end up with sort of algorithms all the way down. <laughs> it's like, you know, Yeah. We, yeah. I, and, know, I mean we, and also in, in this example, like you know, this is the this customer service rep didn't even get any visibility, so they they couldn't. They actually didn't really know how to answer this person's question. Um, and then even thinking through at a higher level whether or not that model was biased. Like I, I will say, I haven't followed the story all the way through, but at at first glance, I think Catherine Neal also had a good article about this. Is it's not whether or not there are these one one-off cases in which things go wrong, 
because fundamentally all of these systems are probabilistic, not deterministic, meaning like there is an error rate and there, things will go wrong. But that is just that is just a true truism. Mm-hmm. That's not even debatable. But what the problem would be is if this is systemic. It's not just that this this one woman with good you know who makes a good salary and has a high credit rating got denied. It would be if right. and obviously that should be fixed. But the system is a problem if we are seeing this across the board, across a number of women, you know, as compared to like a data scientist would have to do an analysis of this system to see if it's a problem. And, and certainly, I mean, it's easy to come up with examples from across different parts of society and parts of technology where, you know, this algorithmic, uh, algorithmic bias reflects systemic bias and that we have oh, those absolutely. problems. And and absolutely. I think the, the discourse on that is is raising, but it seems like we probably also need, you know, beyond discourse, we need other solutions. Where are you on regulations for, mu- for much of this? Like, how, where are you feeling like we stand on, you know, the maturity of that discussion and, and where we need to be with, with that? Yeah, um, it's been really interesting to see what different regulatories are, what regulatory bodies are coming up with all around the world. Um, so most likely Europe will be ahead of the pack on this. Um, the European Commission's uh, the, the HLEG has come up with a white paper that came out in April. I think there's a follow-up to it that's scheduled for December, but who knows in pandemic times if they're going to get everything done by then, uh, which would be understandable if they didn't. The UK Information Commissioner's Office also has like a really great paper on risk-based approaches to understanding AI systems. Um, Singapore has launched this project called Project Veritas, which is getting financial services, financial service agencies together with their financial regulatory bodies are thinking about it. In the U.S., we've had uh, the FTC, Federal Reserve. Like, there's been a lot of noise, and there are also bills on the table. And what, what we've seen, interestingly, is there's been this bottom-up movement in the U.S. So, for example, banning facial recognition mm-hmm. is such a great example. We see it. We saw it starting in cities right. before we see we saw anything happening at the federal level. There are algorithmic accountability bills in like in uh, multiple different cities and states. And again, before we see it hitting at the federal level. So I think the U.S. is going to be really interesting, uh, just as, again, as a political scientist, yeah. focused on American politics. This is why American politics is fascinating, because of the way we've divided federal and state powers and how that push-pull like ends up being like sometimes a contentious debate. But ultimately, like back to like my first point, it's good to have people with different opinions talking. Right. Sure, and, uh, that, that's kind of what ends up being. And it also seems like it gives, you know, in theory at least, it gives an interesting model for being able to test different approaches yeah. in different markets yeah. and see, you know, what are the consequences of doing it this way versus that way, uh, and and then what's going to happen with that at scale. But yeah, of course, absolutely. yeah, of course, that's a uh, it. It supposes that that um, that we can actually anticipate the scale. Uh, with just what happens at that city level, and often, often that's uh, right. that's going to be very different when it's applied federally. Right, but, exactly. Yeah, those are that's that's such an interesting area for you, given your political science background. So, do you find that you're drawn more and more into those not only governance discussions within uh, corporations, but the governance at an actual sort of political uh, government level? Are you uh, participating more and more in those kinds of uh, discussions? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I, I kind of have been from, well, I wouldn't say day, well, no, almost from day one. Um, and I I don't know whether it's because it's just my inclination to do so, whether it's kind of a natural part of this job, um, because it does kind of combine both. I can't just think about the technology. I would be remiss not to think about what sort of policy and regulation would be, would be coming down the road, uh, in part because, you know, I want all these public servants to make informed decisions. Um, and, you know, it is difficult to wrap your head around the technology when you've, like, you know, your experience has been something totally different. And it's very difficult to get good information, mm-hmm. um, you know, from, from these different bodies. And, and like all these groups have, you know, people may have, you know, different uh, incentives and different reasons for sharing certain kinds of information, not sharing others. But also I think, you know, when it comes down to businesses, everyone just wants to know what the regulatory landscape will be. And it's useful to have that information. I mean, not that I have any sort of insider information, but just to be aware of what's happening so that businesses can make good decisions. Um, you know, so they're they're kind of building products with the future in mind. 
Yeah, and you know, so sort of speaking of building products with the future in mind, I, I guess I'm I'm curious about your own disposition and views. Like, are there particular uh, applications of AI or just emerging technologies in general that you get really really excited about that sort of maybe even fill you with hope for what they the, for the good they could potentially do? Gosh, um, I feel like lately like, everything is very doom and gloomy. Because <laughs> yeah. it, is, it, it is 2020, so it's like just the world is on fire. Um, what, what a great question. Honestly, this is a very good question to ask. Um, I, 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 what I think is amazing about this technology at a meta level and what interested me in it, uh, in, in technology, is just how much amazing potential it has for us to question our institutional paradigms and, and us to question why things are structured the way they are. And I think the, the thing, if I were to pick one thing that got me the most interested in this technology is actually the potential for, for ed tech, which is funny because ed tech has now become one of the biggest topics of conversation in talking about all the negative of the surveillance state. Right. But you think about it, like what's the, what it should be, what something like ed tech should be is a complete reimagining of education because number one, like, Educational systems do not actually help uh, do not actually help people get jobs. They don't help people do well at their jobs. Like everyone always jokes about the number one skill you need to learn in college is Excel, because and that's the one thing they don't teach you, right? So it's it, there is this disconnect between the like, quote the real world, the jobs we get, and then education, educational systems. How they're we know there there's inequality. We know that people in the U.S. end up with massive student loans. You know, there's just so so much that can be resolved with this technology, whether it's remote learning or customized learning or, you know, like whatever it is. And early on in the days of when, when I started my job at Accenture, even before then, people were talking about lifelong learning and how, you know, the sort of new world of technology and AI really means that we have to embrace, you know, learning and really think about how we're going to spend the rest of our lives educating us. All of this, like, what, what amazing aspirations yeah um right and and i sincerely hope that we, what we don't do is just try to like stick technology into the existing broken infrastructure that is our traditional education system because that that would be a disservice not just to us as humanity but also to the technology and the potential of technology itself but is it is it also true or not that once you use technology to sort of accelerate or amplify a, a given system, that where it breaks might be what's instructive about where those institutions are already failing us. Like we, we yeah. won't know those failings until we try to amplify them at some level, right? I mean, I understand that there are real harms that are being caused right. by doing that and the impacts are real, but I'm I'm also wondering if, uh, if it's not... Um, if we won't get to the, the level of, of discussion about the failings of those systems until they're actually being amplified, do, do you think there's a way that we can we can do that uh, effectively? Um, I mean, I think specifically using the education example, there are so many people that have already looked at the inefficiency of these systems and what does work and what doesn't work. And, you know, what, and if we really think about this again, like going back to this notion of human self-determination or, you know, whether it's meaning or whatever mm -hmm. we're talking about, like mm -hmm. what is the, purpose of this system and you know frankly can we just objectively take a step back and uh, in a sense almost emotionlessly ask is it serving the purpose it is intended to serve right like it, you know like, what is the meaning of our educational system why is it doing this i think there are plenty of people who have been pointing out the systemic flaws sure. and i think usually the pushback is that oh it's easy to criticize the system like but but who's going to be the one to solve the problem and really the smart thing to then say is well, now we have technologies and systems that theoretically could be designed to solve these problems instead of being designed to simply reinforce the power imbalance and the structural inequalities. And we're going to ignore what these people say because it's too messy to deal with that and much easier to just perpetuate, amplify, and now like cement uh, all of these yes. in inequalities rather than do like the extra amount of work it would take to like fix things. Yes. No. And that that's a brilliant way to address that. Uh, that mm -hmm. mindset or that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, what, where do you think the, the solutions best originate? Are you finding, in, in your experience, do you find that the solutions uh, origin, uh, originate with academics or with private corporations? Or is it kind of a mix in, in, in what you've seen in terms of being able to identify the, the sort of structural flaws of institutions and what's going to happen when they're brought to scale with technology? Yeah. 
Um, I think it's a bit of both. Um, you know, I I love all of my academic friends because they you know they do such an, an insightful job of understanding systems. Of, you know, and again, like they're sometimes able to look at it more objectively because they're not inside it. Um, but then there is the aspect of there is the application component of it, and that's you know what industry does. So I'll give you a great example. Um, so about what two years ago at this point, a little over two years ago. Um, Accenture came out with a fairness tool, so we were the first to create a enterprise-level bias mitigation tool. Um, and the way we did it was we started off with academic research papers on, you know, this is things like counterfactual fairness, bias mitigation, blah, 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 and you can find all of these papers. But what was important to us is whether this works outside of a laboratory setting. Mm. I think we started off with like 30-some-odd papers, and we only ended up with actually three, three of them that worked if we thought about does this scale, you know, is this generalizable across multiple different settings, and is this possible within the way a data scientist does work? So that was basically our, our criteria. Um, so I think everybody has their role to play. But it's, there's, some, there's definitely value in pursuing research, and even research that seems crazy and weird, but then there is certainly value to trying to ground that research in something pragmatic and applicable. Like, it's it is wonderful to live in a world of like all of these possibilities, but then at some point, if you want to make these reality, you have to ask yourself, will people use it? How can I make it so that somebody will use it? And is this actually as beneficial as people are claiming it can be? And, and does it matter, do you think, in the, the, the context in which the technology starts? You know, we were, we were talking a little bit before we got on about this mm-hmm. current story about, uh, that, that broke, I think, today about Facebook using a simulation uh, with AI to uh, to simulate bots and other kind of bad user mm-hmm. behavior so that mm-hmm. they knew better how to moderate against it, um, which I think, you know, I think you had said at one level of abstraction seems like a really good idea from like a data science mm-hmm. model, right? But from another level of looking at it, you can easily see how this may not be um, ideal to train, to, to begin to, to develop that sort of training. So so is there, does it matter where the the kind of origins of, of a technology are? Or, or do we do we always need to be working toward, you know, these good outcomes and the best of humanity sort of outcomes? Yeah, um, so two parts to it. One, I think all of my STS and HCI friends, and I agree with them, would say um, the origin of technology absolutely does matter. Like, mm-hmm. This is why so many people study the history of technology. You know, things that are built for uh, military use, even if it is moved into the commercial space, which is, by the way, a lot of technology, Mm -hmm. will still hold with it the vestiges of, let's say, surveillance Mm -hmm. or monitoring, because it is ultimately built assuming the world is a particular way. In other words, there are good people and bad people. There's me, then there are the others, right? There's me, then there's there's the people I'm protecting, the people I'm fighting, because that's just how the military is structured. Right, so, so then it's just fundamentally how your view of the world will impact the technology that you build. And I think that's really, really important. And, and maybe even to abstract it even more and going back to like all this conversation about quote, political correctness culture and you know, designing an AI that quote, hides itself, I think what, what Paul may be missing and some of you may be missing is that um, often you create technology with a, well, not often, you do, you create your AI with an optimization function. Like there's a goal. To this, and this has kind of been some of the critiques of the way, um, like, you know, some of these research firms have been trying to arrive at, at uh, sentient AI mm-hmm. is by having them play these games, and they have them play combative games, mm-hmm. right? Rather than have them play collaborative right. games. And again, your objective function matters. If my objective function is to win a game where I have to kill everybody to win, or it's a zero sum world in which I have to have the most amount of points to win, right? Um, then that sets up a very different system than one in which I'm training it to play a game where we have to be collaborative and collectively succeed. Right? Two totally different worlds, but it's all a function of your of your objective function. So going back to this like, Facebook example, I think it is actually really cool to mm-hmm. kind of they're basically like simulating red teaming, which is kind of awesome because rather than kind of wait for bad things to happen, they're saying we're gonna kind of proactively model the world. But the problem with it could be is that you have to, it's not necessarily future adaptable. And if a new thing starts to happen, that obviously cannot be modeled within the existing system that you've built because your existing system is only based on the past. And I think a really good pragmatic example might literally be something like Gamergate, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of folks, and especially the women who are impacted by Gamergate will say, 
you know, we were yelling and screaming about how Gamergate was really like the canary in the coal mine about like this whole incel culture, this whole like underground culture of like just, you know, like a, a lot of the a lot of the issues that we talk about today, um, people getting harassed and doxxed and, you know, all of this was you know, the, the canary in the coal mine was Gamergate and people ignored it. But then yeah. you think about it, if you're trying to build a predictive model, predictive system, Gamergate prior to Gamergate would not fit into your paradigm of the world because that had never really happened like that before. Right. So it's a good idea if the world is going to stay static. If the world's going to change, you actually need to have some balance to it that understands how the world's changing. Yeah, and I think by the same token, it, it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier about, you know, there's there's a body of work already that has identified mm -hmm. problems. Like there the the, um, the scholars that have already identified problems with ed tech and, and sort of the systems yeah. of institutional education, you know, th that that knowledge already exists, the, the the scholarship already exists, so that it's parallel here, it feels like there's been yeah. plenty of, of um, uh, light being shown on some of the areas that need the most work in terms of content moderation, in terms of uh, making sure yeah. that, you know, uh, bad actors are, are banned and, and that can't get through on, on all the social platforms. But it seems that Twitter, Facebook, you know, and so on don't necessarily adopt those those recommendations. And instead, it's like Facebook wants to play a game with itself <laughs> in order to come up with uh, this this war game, as you as you so aptly described, to be able to identify what it probably could identify just by taking the recommendations of experts who have been saying this kind of thing, right? Is right. That fair? I mean, um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I think there is certainly value in, like, from a data science perspective in trying to do what they're doing at scale. Like, one of the issues of, like, any sort of moderation or tracking is just the sheer volume, right? There's just, like, I can't even create a number to imagine how many harassing situations or flagged posts there must be on all of the social media. So how do they, like, parse through? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's actually, like, again, from a, like a data science perspective, kind of a similar problem to thinking about things like credit fraud, uh -huh. just at a massive, massive scale. So the, the cool slash interesting, I, I think the cool part of the problem of addressing things like credit fraud is like, yes, there are people trying to defraud your system, but also there are people who just like happen to go on a vacation in Germany and right. like didn't call their credit card company. Yeah. And then how do you do it in a way that you're not gonna lose a customer because you're annoying them with phone calls or you're freezing their credit, right? So it's like, it's not just like shut down everything that looks bad. And it 